and he's one of the most awarded HR professionals working in the UK today and listed as one of the top 100 HR directors in the world by HRD Global. In January, David was made a chartered companion of the uh, Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. So I know, and I know he's really proud of that as well as he should be because it's such a rare accolade to be given. He's also in, in, the, in, the, in the mass of his many awards, HR Director of the Year. And he was awarded that um, by the Personnel Today Awards in November when we were made uh, Employment Law Firm of the Year. So it's yet another link in our long relationship. <laughs> And David introduced agility at the FSCS a couple of years ago, so he's got actually loads of practical experience as well. And the question we're looking today is whether agile working um, is uh, can improve uh, inclusivity in the workplace. And I think it's a really interesting topic. And uh, you know, we're right at the beginning of that of that discussion, but it begs the question: uh, What is agility? And I, I think I need to make this clear at the beginning as a lawyer, sort of define my terms. Um, but it is very much at the moment a debate about location of work. And I think that's really what we're talking about today is whether or not if you shift the way that people work, so they work where they want to work or at home, whether that means uh, you'll have different thinking on inclusivity in the workplace. Now, uh, we've all well, most of us have been working from home quite a bit in the last year, if uh, not entirely. I've been working at home for almost a year now, exclusively. And um, there has been a bit of a backlash recently. So we had um, Boris Johnson saying we were going to return to the offices in a few short months the other day. Um, I'm not sure what a short month is uh, now that we're through February. Um, but he said he was confident workers would return to tr traditional work patterns when lockdown restrictions were eased. And the chief executive of Goldman Sachs um, actually went a bit further and he said he thought homeworking was an aberration, which is quite a pejorative term, actually. I was quite shocked by that. Um, and it must be corrected as soon as possible. So if you work for Goldman Sachs, you'll be going back to work five, five days a week in the office, in fact, seven days a week in the office quite soon. Um, now, that is not what everyone is. Our clients are telling us they're going to do. And uh, I know that many of our clients are looking at floor space and improved product productivity of people working from home at the moment and are taking a different view. But I thought um, before we kick off, um, I'm going to be uh, asking you your views on this. And before I do that, I need to do a bit of housekeeping. So for those of you who aren't Trans Tuesdays regulars, um, we're recording the session. The recording will be available afterwards on our website and uh, we will send you a recording of the session in a follow up email. Uh, if you would like to submit questions, please do so using the Q&A function. Try and keep the chat for chatting because it's really difficult for me to keep on top of all the questions. Um, um, but submit your questions to, to us. We've already had quite a number of questions which we will try and answer. You can submit questions anonymously if you would rather, but we try and answer the questions that we don't get to by email um, afterwards. And we can't do that if you've submitted your question anonymously. So are we ready? Yes, we are. Right. OK, I'm going to set, start off by um, launching a poll. And I'd be really grateful if you could all answer the poll, which is how do you expect people in your organisation to work in the future? Full time home working for more than 50 percent, hybrid working or home working is an aberration back to work. Really interesting to see. I know I think I think I know the answer, but I want to know what you think. <laughs> and while we while we wait for people to complete the poll, I'm going to kick off with our first question. So I'm going to ask David, first of all, uh, David, uh, yeah, what's agile working going to look like in the future? And Mike has specifically asked, when do the staff, when do staff really need to be in the office, excluding staff such as receptionists? Uh, Emma, uh, good morning and uh, good morning to um, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, that's a really, really good opening question. And I think one of the things that we should all be reflecting on is uh, what is the office for? So actually you said, actually, I think that so much of the debate right now is about uh, location. And whilst I don't want to prejudge the outcome of the uh, poll, um, 
there are two really interesting um, studies that sort of bookend the period of lockdown. So um, back in July, when we'd only just come out of the first lockdown, and the second lockdown uh, was, a, was something in the future. Uh, ADECO, the world's largest recruitment firm, um, undertook a study which is called Resetting Normal. Uh, they interviewed 8,000 people across eight countries um, globally. And uh, in that study, there were five key findings. I'm not going to talk about all five of them uh, today, but I am going to talk about um, the first two of them. And the first one was actually this idea about where do people want to work? And the very, very clear message was that people wanted to split their time between the home and the office. And uh, the split was about 60-40. So, you know, 40% of the time, 60% of the time at home, 40% in the office. The second key finding of the um, survey was that people wanted greater flexibility within their working day. So actually, I think in terms of what does agility look like in the future, I do think it means the end of the nine to five, because I think it's not just about where um, people wanting to work in choosing where they want to work. I think they want to choose the structure of their own day. Fast forward to uh, much more recently, only in the last uh, few weeks, the CIPD in um, partnership with Microsoft have published uh, their study, uh, Work Smarter to Live Better. Um, you know, so a year's now passed. So actually, and does it tell, does that survey, does that study tell us um, anything differently? Um, no, it doesn't. It tells us very similar that actually with time, the passage of time, people are still saying that the, that the flexibility that this has afforded them is something that they want to retain. So whilst uh, uh, um, people are describing the uh, return, going back home working as an aberration and that we'll all be, should all be back in the office, I would be hugely surprised if um, that is the overarching trend because so many of the arguments around um, uh, flexible working or working in an agile way are now redundant, that it will reduce your productivity, that it will reduce employee engagement, that it will impact on customer experience. Organisations like the Financial Services Compensation Scheme know that that isn't true. So, you know, we know that actually we're delivering a better service with high levels of engagement and we have maintained our productivity. So the argument that says agility doesn't work um, uh, I personally feel quite strongly that all the data says uh, that the argument is um, redundant. Um, what do I think it will look like in the future? I think it is hybrid, um, is my sense. I think in answer to this question, what is the office for? I think at the FSES, we have, we very clearly see the office as being part of our long-term future. Um, but using it in a very different way so that the office is for building business collaboration and social connection. If you are deciding, I think the question we all have to ask ourselves, and we'll probably get onto some of this today, what are some of the behaviours that we need to change? I think if you are getting up in the morning and saying, what is the outcome that I want to deliver today? And therefore, what's the best, what's the best way to do that? Or where's the best place to do that? So if I'm going to um, have a one-to-one -one with colleagues or a face-to-face -face meeting, maybe that's best for me to go into the office to do that, to maintain that social connection. Maybe I want to bring my team who will be meeting on a, in a hybrid basis most of the time together once a month to have a brainstorming session or to do something that's creative. So I do think that um, that, that is what I, th I think the future is. We asked our uh, colleagues last summer um, you know, to um, when do staff really need to be in the office to Mike's question. So we asked that question. We asked colleagues last summer, we said, uh, when we start to think about how we utilize the office, how often do you think that you need to, how often would you see yourselves being in? And they said um, one to two days, actually. And they said, once the anxiety around um, the vaccination, so actually we'd probably see that being more like two to three days when actually we were further forward in our journey. 
And we already had a flexible working principle that said you will spend a reasonable amount of time in the office. So our evolution of that, our, our sort of agile evolution, based on the feedback of our colleagues, was what we call our 40-40 rule. So we say, on average, we'll expect 40% of our people to be in the office on any given day 40% of the time. So, you know, that's, you know, so we want to give people a sort of framework. Equally, we don't want to give people a sort of straight jacket that says it must be these things. We're saying, actually, within your teams, we think a good set of principles is this idea about being in the office about, on average, 40% of the time, which was really well um, received. Um, and I see that Mike in his question talks very specifically about receptionists. Um, we've already taken the decision that we don't need receptionists. That actually, on the basis that the organ that we will have fewer um, public visitors to the building, um, actually we can redistribute those tasks amongst other colleagues in the. So it has had an impact in that way. But again, I think I'd close my thing by saying the real key question I think is for all of us to think about. What are we using our office environment for? That's fantastic, David. What a great start. So uh, I'm now going to close the poll and share the and share the results. And Paul, I'm uh, you know David's talked about he reckons the future for the FSCS is is hybrid working. So um, do you? Does everybody who's logged in think the same way? And the answer is. You do, <laughs> overwhelmingly, 95% are moving to hybrid working. Um, so Goldman Sachs is clearly not on the call. So Paul, what's your view of that? Is that what you were expecting? And what do yes, you see agile working like in the future? I, I think, um, as David has put it really, <laughs> the purpose is very much focused on uh, why, why you doing things what what are the activities that you carry out so a lot of it's going to be still individual because i think um you, you can't sort of come up with a one-size-fits-all approach to these things so i think it's very much individual organizations even teams looking at why uh they want to come to the office why they want to work remotely and why do they um carry out certain activities at all I mean, I think that's part of the thing. Sometimes we're carrying out activities we probably don't need to carry out. So I think it's very much looking at purpose. It's very much looking at work activities and looking at the practicalities around the capabilities of the team and the digital environment that we live in, because a lot of this is all enabled, uh, certainly working remotely, is about our digital capabilities and how we use them. And my kind of uh, soapbox at the moment is very much about, we, sh we should be looking at things in terms of uh, screens, not desks. So when we're looking at space, these days we can actually get our communication on a screen. Um, it's not really on a desk. The thing that we use might be, possibly be on a desk, but it could just as equally be in a briefcase or elsewhere. So I think the key is work it out for your own organization, understand the capabilities, understand the work activities that you need to carry out and, and focus on the purpose. And I think it doesn't surprise me that a lot of people after the pandemic uh, experience are looking for probably not commuting as much and perhaps having uh, some time at home to uh, carry out certain works, but not everything is going to be suitable for working in the home. So work it out for yourself. Great, thank you, Paul. And uh, we've had a few questions in. So Judy says, if the workplace becomes a place where people visit less often and work from home more, how can firms ensure a sense of belonging physically and culturally to the firm they're employed by? I think that's a that's quite an interesting question, actually. Um, I, I often say, you know, we say work um, is an activity, not, not necessarily a place. And I think um, belonging is about communities. And so it's, again, not necessarily uh, focused on place. And I think that's that's the essence of, of what we need to look at. 
creating communities which may be in a place, but they may not be in a place. So I think as David said, you, you know, you kind of got the mothership where you, you probably have the hub of the organization, the brand and so on. But I think beyond that, really we're looking at communities. Yeah. And Deanne asks, do you think there'll be conflict between what employers want and what employees want? And, and actually an anonymous um, uh, questionnaire has asked, would you recommend doing regular mini surveys to check people are still fine with more home working? Um, yes, uh, um, Deanna, one of the things that we've done um, very consistently at the FSES is that at very at the beginning, we said that our entire strategy, our entire response would be driven by um, the data that our employees provided with us. And um, I have a very, a very simple um, three step mantra, which is engage, listen and act. And we've been asking the same six questions um, consistently since um, March of 2020. We most recently did that in February. So people's ability to disconnect um, from work, their overall happiness, what is changing in terms of that moving picture about how much time they want to be in the office. Now, interestingly, because I noticed uh, in one of the other questions, I think, Neil, about the differences that young people, um, that different age demographics, um, I absolutely agree, Neil. One of our um, observations is that you have to encourage people to own their day. Now, what we know is that you're right. Younger colleagues will want to be in the office. Will want to be in the office more, which is why we've equally said, if you want to be in the office five days a week, you can be in the office five days a week. You know, we're not saying it's this. I think Paul makes a really important point about it is not one size. Um, fits all. So um, do I think that there's, I think that, you know, I guess that tension between employers and employees, you don't always have to um, completely agree with what the, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, if we were asked the question, give you a really specific example, can I permanently work from home? Is a question that we were asked last year, and we've taken an organisational view that no, you can't. And we, and we set out all the reasons why. And for the reasons that we said, we think that the cultural connection to the organization is really, really important. Now, that 40%, you might decide that in a month, you come in for 10 days, all in one big block, and do all of the stuff that you need to do, and then just be a few, you know, we're giving people the flexibility to do that. But actually, we said, no, we don't think full-time home working is right for us as an employer. So I think there is, I think it's really important, but I think unless you engage with people and ask them, I don't think, I mean, you won't know, you'll just be creating a strategy that's on the basis of no feedback, which um, I think what they're doing at Goldman Sachs. And, um, and before I um, think, can I just quickly share something with, uh, I saw that Lee Sukas talks about carers and key workers. Lee, this, 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 pop, this um, resonates with me, my husband, uh, Lawrence uh, works for a social uh, care provider, um, so uh, I, I know all about that. Um, there's some really interesting, a person who would be a good person to connect with um, on um, LinkedIn is a lady called Jane Galloway. If you're interested, Jane Galloway is running the, is leads on the introduction of flexible working across the NHS for NHS employers. And they're doing some really, really interesting um, work. I was at a talk a few months ago that Jane spoke at, and um, so, because um, it is, you're absolutely right. It's a different, some different challenges there, but I wanted to share that. Jane Galloway is the, uh, is the person. Okay. And then uh, Nicola, on to you. Claire has asked, um, please can we discuss contracts and whether there needs to be a change? And Mike has asked a question this morning about the liability on employers to provide home office setup. Um, if you're giving, you know, you're giving the option of agile working for requiring people to work from home. You want to go through the legals? Yeah, absolutely. You know, from, oh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so on the question of contracts, um, first of all, yeah, pro most likely, yes, this is going to need an update to your contracts on the question of where people work and when they're required to come into the office. Of course, the big factor is that whatever your contracts currently say are probably not how people have been working for the last year. So you're not starting from kind of zero when it comes to looking at what's, um, what the current position is. Um, 
but yeah absolutely if um if your current if your contracts currently say you know you will be based at x office location monday to friday nine to five or you know 36 hours a week or whatever it is that clearly is not going to be the case um for uh, you know for introducing a hybrid or agile way of working going forward um so yes, changes to contracts are likely and changes to policies as well. And part of that will include um, the question of what the what responsibility, what the employer is going to invest in to help people work at home. And I think this does feed into the question of how younger colleagues feel about home working. Um, it's absolutely uh, absolutely right that you know we've seen that younger colleagues are may be less likely to have dedicated separate office or working space at home. Um, if they are more junior, probably, you know, got less spare cash to spend on upgrading IT equipment, less space to have a separate office chair or whatever it is. Um, all of this legally, all of this links back to an employer's health and safety obligations. Um, so if your if employees are working from home, the the employer's obligation to look at um, making sure that they have a safe place to work um, extends to their home environment. So you need to be conducting, um, you know, health and safety risk assessments about how people are working at home, and then considering, you know, what reasonably do you need to provide. Now that won't be the same for every employee. Um, I mean, if someone's got uh, you know, if if somebody already has a decent home office set up, has got decent IT equipment, um, you know, and has the ability to make choices for themselves, then fine. Um, but if you're in a, in a, if you're moving to an environment where perhaps by definition there is not enough space for everybody to come into the office on any given day, um, so you know there is there is some pressure for people to be at home at least some of the time, then that might suggest that actually an employer needs to do more to make sure that they have a suitable setup at home. Um, I wanted to touch on a couple of the other health and safety factors or kind of well-being factors that we're seeing affect this discussion at the moment. Um, because of course, with the you know the whole COVID pandemic, we've seen the fact that you know employers now have to take responsibility for how employees are traveling to and from work in a way that perhaps wasn't the case before. And of course, COVID is a factor in the moment at the the level of risk people are willing to take or actually are able to take when it comes to traveling but that is going to change as the vaccine rollout happens um you know and i think we're beginning to see sort of people get i just saw i, I saw before we came on i saw something um flash up on a bbc alert i think about you know the over 80s who've had both their vaccines are now much more likely to be breaking lockdown rules, which I'm not at all surprised to, to hear. I would be too if, I'd, if I was in that category. I think if I'd you been locked up for a year, if I wasn't a lawyer and <laughs> if I hadn't been able to go out for a year. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll see people get people's app, you know, people's willingness to, to travel, um, you know, the sort of appetite for, uh, for, for that will, will change, I think, over the next um over the next uh, few months um but we, you know, the government's been absolutely clear with us uh, in the last you know, since the announcement of what as part of the announcement of the roadmap um that covid zero is not possible so we are going to have a situation where covid is endemic rather than pandemic so you know it cases will go up in the winter we expect so is that going to affect where people want to be the other factor I wanted to touch on was an employer's overall duty towards employees well-being um there's a, there's been a lot of commentary and a lot of evidence obviously about the mental health effects of lockdown and of working from home on a long-term basis but a lot of that is not linked to working from home per se that is about living through a global crisis and um, this is you know working from home at the moment with having you know perhaps having to homeschool not being able to get out to do your normal you know, whatever your normal outlets are, whether that's sport or going to the theatre or just going to the pub or whatever. You know. So, you know, th these are not normal home working situations. Um, and actually, in contrast to that, um, we've seen a lot of people uh, recognise the benefits of not having to commute for two hours a day and having some flexibility to be able to get out in the middle of the day for some fresh air in a way that, you know, if you if you would normally be, you know, working through, uh, you know, nine to five in an office or more, 
Um, so allowing people some flexibility to take responsibility for their for their well-being and choosing where they are and how they do that um, can have some real benefits as well. So we've we've had a few sorry, Nick, we've it, had a few it. questions in about well-being and monitoring. Um, and uh, I think I'm going to suggest that we we write to you separately. We have done other Travis Tuesdays on well-being, and I think we have we unfortunately we don't really have time to explore it today. Um, but there is lots of information out there. Um, in terms of the mental health of the pandemic and um, we'd, put, we'd signpost you to mind um, and uh, very much the and the health and safety executive and some of the um, support that they've given. Um, I'd like to move on to the big question really which is can agile working make the workforce more inclusive? So Nicola do you want to just kick off there with a, a look at the Equality Act? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously from the legal angle, we look at this from the perspective of, you know, groups of people sharing protected characteristics. Um, and the obvious category of um, people that home working can benefit are uh, is anybody with a particular vulnerability, whether that's whether that's COVID or just uh, something that makes it difficult to travel or spend a lot of time in, a, in an office or whatever it is. Um, so adapting to hybrid working or agile working could well be a reasonable adjustment for some disabled employees. Um, I think we've also seen a huge impact um, on those with caring responsibilities, um, like parents or those with older relatives um, who, they, who they have responsibilities for. Um, I think it's really interesting. I mean, there's lots of um, data out there and lots of trends out there about you know, it being women who've, been, who've taken on the majority of the additional household responsibilities but actually in some of the data that we're getting um, from our team actually the 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 fathers want to spend uh, more time at home with their families and it's been revelatory uh, for them as well it's not just it's not just mothers um, so I think there's some you know some real interesting things there as we've touched on though of course but typically younger people want more time in the office want more time uh, with social contacts and and of course they, they're likely to want more time one of the issues that we've seen is about supervision time and that kind of on the job osmosis learning that you do by just by being in the room with uh, different people in your team when you're when you're new to a role or new to an organization so I think those are some of the factors that we'd need to need to be considering but absolutely I think there's real potential for um, agile working to make the workplace more inclusive definitely. Great, and I'm going to ask you now to um, to look at, to contribute to a second poll, um, really about your experiences during uh, the pandemic, um, which is, have you noticed any of the recruitment trends um, that we list uh, when recruiting during lockdown? And uh, while people answer that, I'm going to ask um, uh, Paul first. Um, what uh, do you think the agile, agile working can make the workforce more inclusive? Who's thriving? I think um, I think you said yes. I think is the answer to that. It can be. Um, obviously, it's how people apply it. Again, is 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 the important piece. Whether people actually do respond to that capability to drawing a more diverse workforce, so carers and, and uh, the vulnerable and so on. Um, so I, th I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, in, in my experience, um, for some time uh, back in BT some years ago, the um, call centres, for instance, is a typical example where historically it was always kept in an office, a call centre office, if you like, and people were uh, not able to work from home in that situation. I think that's changed quite a bit over the last few years. So increasingly home workers and I think the pandemic experience has highlighted a lot of transactional work can can be carried out remotely now provided you have the necessary secure secure environment and the digital capability so I think that widens the workforce uh, in, in diverse terms to draw in people who haven't you know can't be there full time can't travel um, and it, and it also expands the geographical capability as well. So you're not just um, looking at uh, people in a particular geography, whether it be in, you know, in this country or, or, or abroad, in fact. So it, it, 
it's widening that possibility. Um, it still relies on culture to ensure that that happens. So there's still organisations that are worried about it, and there are technical worries about that, obviously, particularly data security. But uh, I think the simple answer is yes, and I'm sure it already has had a big impact over the last 12 months. A much broader sense of a pool, a, a bigger pool, really, from which you can, uh, you know, choose your talents. And actually, um, the poll is very interesting. So I'm going to end the polling and share the, the contents of that. And David, ask you for your views on it. So um, of the of the outcome, 72 percent of applicants now expect home working. What's well, lucky? Cause we're all going to do it, aren't we? And then um, but 72 percent are applicants applying from further away from the office. And I did read a really interesting um, survey that was done by Robert Staff Recruitment and they said uh, two in five workers surveyed, uh, well 39% were planning to relocate to another country or city while working remotely and um, uh, and uh, the sales in uh, some residential estate agents in outside the London have increased by almost 200% which implies that people from London are moving out of London so that's it's interesting that that's borne out that in the recruitment figures for our for our colleagues on the call David what's your view Do, can agile working make the workforce more inclusive Yes, um, to echo Paul's, uh, you know, the, the short answer is absolutely yes. I just want to pick up on that point um, from the survey, um, Emma, which is really interesting. So actually, our, that is my, that is our lived experience of the last year at the FSES. So that a number of colleagues who have, where we've had open dialogue about them relocating outside of London. Yeah. So them saying, actually, and it picks up on one of the earlier points around often this has been, um, you know, younger colleagues uh, who might be, you know, newly engaged or newly cohabiting or newly married um, and saying, actually, I can, as opposed to fighting over who gets the one desk and whose turn it is to put the laptop on the ironing board, um, I can sell my one bedroom flat and I can go have a very, very rather nice house, you know, outside of the M25 with a garden. And so, you know, we've now got colleagues who've relocated, you know, back to the Midlands, to Yorkshire, um, to Liverpool, and also to Paul's point, and it does re widen your recruitment pool. We've re recently recruited um, a head of function who is based in Leeds. Actually, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So I think, so th there's something about that. I think um, two groups that I really want to um, call out. I think it's not just, I'm glad you talked about um, dads. Um, I think it is working parents, um, absolutely, um, uh, definitely. Um, I was being interviewed by um, working dads last, uh, last week and talking about the 100% take up of shared parental leave that we have at the FSES. So every single wow. um, male colleague takes extended um, absence. Um, and so I do think that, you know, so A, I think that thing about reimagining who shares the, the burden I think is a really, I think is is really powerful because I think that creates um, both opportunities for fathers. Oh, I'm not moving around, so my lights have gone out. So um, I'll get up and move around in a minute. Uh, I now look slightly ghoulish, so apologies for that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think there is a really interesting. Um, I think you're right about um, disability and caring responsibilities, and again, we've seen that. So things that would potentially have excluded people in the past, or not necessarily have excluded them. Actually, what I think the trend is, is people engaging with the recruitment process, because I think very often, actually, they wouldn't have even put themselves forward. So, you know, they wouldn't actually have thought about applying because they'd have gone, well, you know, I won't apply because the chances of me getting shortlisted, I will be knocked out because of all of these other factors. So that I think is really interesting. Um, you know, I think that is and I think we are f seeing that in terms of types of applicants, the number of applicants um, for in our recruitment process. Really interesting. Now we had a couple of questions um, about people working from ab abroad and that does give you unintended legal consequences that you need to consider quite carefully. We haven't really got time to consider it yet on this call. 
Um, but it's really interesting that what you're saying, David and Paul, is that, you know, more opportunities for working parents, for people who would otherwise have been excluded or, and uh, in, in particular um, disabled applicants. So there are some plus points, clearly, that we're already seeing, which mean that uh, it is potentially more inclusive. We've had a few questions in about uh, the experience of um, how, from Charlotte. How does agile working impact on EDI activity in the office, I think, you know, David, I don't know if you can answer that question. So I think um, how it impacts, I think, um, I'll give you, I'll always like to give really specific examples. I think one of the learnings from um, last year's um, Black Lives Matters conversation, um, and I think this, I'm going to give you sort of try and answer two themes in some of these questions. So one of these things around culture, and connection and how do you be, um, it's, it's about using, I think as Paul said, it's about really utilizing the technology that we have available to us and not using it in, um, trying to use it in innovative ways. So, you know, in relation to um, the EDI question specifically, what we learned from um, Black Lives Matter last year was that we needed to create a space organizationally for our colleagues to have open and honest conversations. And we couldn't do that face to face. So actually how you do that is that you use the technology to do that. So rather, so actually saying, so our chief operating officer said, I'm going, we're gonna have a session. It's gonna be two hours. There is no particular agenda. I'm inviting my black colleagues uh, to share um, their stories. And it was colleague led. So what came out of that was actually a, a desire by um, black colleagues to continue those, that conversation. And all we were actually doing as an employer was uh, was using the technology. So what we were providing was the technology and the channel for that communication to happen. And I think in the same way, culturally, you have to try and create those spaces that we have lost through lockdown. So the water cooler moments, the coffee breaks, those very, you know, the chats that you have in the breakout area when you're putting your lunch in the microwave. So all of those things we've recreated virtually. So it doesn't have to be a meeting that has an agenda. So our CEO, Caroline Rainbird, has an, organizes a, has a, does her coffee um, and catch ups virtually. And anyone can turn up and they don't have an agenda and there's an opportunity to have a chat. We created a space for our managers um, to do that. And I know that lots of our teams have done that. So actually rather than saying we're meeting for a reason or we're meeting because there is an agenda item or there's something for us to discuss, why, or indeed, you know, Zoom quizzes and, and after work drinks and all of that sort of stuff that we've all done. Actually, let's just try and recreate some of that space for us just to talk, just to talk. And I think um, what was really interesting, I think, is that you know, from an equality and diversity perspective, that you know, the Black Lives Matter, what came out of that was a series of recommendations from our black colleagues that they then came and presented to the executive team. This is stuff yeah. that we want to do. This is actions yeah. that we want to take. And I think that's really important. It goes back to my engage, listen, act. Our job as the employers is to create the space for those conversations to happen. We don't always have to be guiding or, or facilitating the conversation even. If, give people the space and the opportunity to have those conversations. And then if there's something that they want to share and they want to change or, or you know, address, then enable them to do that. Okay, so David, a specific question from you, from Jessica. How are you facilitating on the job learning? For example, we'd love to have more apprentices for our office type roles, but managers are unsure of how we impart those key skills onto more junior employees. Uh, really good um, question. I think that um, we, uh, everyone is given a uh, buddy when they become, so as part of it, so I think we've really thought looking at the whole, um, re-looking at our onboarding process and what that involves so ensuring that both every single employee when they join the scheme has a connection with somebody in my team so somebody that they know that they can come to and go oh I'm not sure who to ask can you point me in the right direction um, that they have a buddy within their technical space so actually someone who is assigned to help them and um, support them and then also um, through our technical training manager um, and our technical training business partner, 
understanding what is where that what the skills are in relation to our skills matrix i could go on about all this stuff um you know that allows them to say these are the fundamental skills so if you work in a technical claim space there is a route to become accredited for example but it's a really good question and um what it's made us you're right we've had to think about we've always had a very very clear pathway to do that in technical areas you know, so if you're an accountant or a lawyer or somebody who's processing insurance claims, less so in almost every other space. So actually, how do you apply some of that rigor and discipline to every role in the organization? So actually, um, later on today, I'm talking to our, our leaders across the organization about our new approach to career pathways, which is this idea about how do you support somebody through each step of their journey when, as Emma said, you're not getting some of the learning by osmosis that you would have done traditionally. Yeah, I and mean, it's something that we at Trouser are looking at really carefully. So, in fact, what we've done is roll out um, similar sort of buddy system to people who are joining new. We've got two new employment lawyers starting actually this month, and we're, we've you know assigned them buddies within the team. And we're also looking at using um, sort of open Zoom. So you have uh, there are a number of apparently different types of applications. I'm not familiar with them yet. Um, but we're introducing them so you have an open line to somebody all the time so they can hear what you're doing, uh, even though you're both working remotely. So we're looking into how we, we can roll that out. Now, we've had a number of questions um, I'm going to put to you, Nicola. They're all related to the same thing, which is um, uh, uh, expenses, basically. If somebody's working from home, do you have to pay their home to office costs as part of your expenses policy? So it's, a very, that. it's a very good question um, and part of the answer is tax related unfortunately um, so the, the the issue is so if you've got a, a lot of, yeah so the question is about commuting space commuting expenses really um, and I'm sure you all know that ordinarily uh, an employer doesn't cover the ordinary costs of somebody commuting but if somebody is working from home on a full-time basis then they they don't have an ordinary commute or rather they don't have expenses associated with their commute other than you know walking from the kitchen to their office or whatever whatever it is um you know so that wouldn't ordinarily be covered but if there is a requirement to come into the office say part of the time then what you need is uh, to have a, a distinction you need to have a, a record of what is the requirement to come into the office because if they if you have the requirement to come into the office one day a week or your 40 40 uh requirement you need to have that audited somewhere so that on that day they're commuting but if they're if you haven't got that if you're at home full time um you know and it's just an ad hoc as and when you know you come to office then that's then a business expense um, which the employer can cover and is tax deductible. So you need real clarity on what your expectation is, what's contractually agreed with the employee, who decides when they're coming in and making sure that you're keeping a record of that. Because what you obviously what you don't want is to suddenly discover that you're covering the expense of somebody, you know, commuting from their holiday home in Barbados or wherever it is that they've been allowed to move to. Um, I mean, that'd be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm dreaming of dreaming of summits on the beach at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't. I, I, that's probably that's a very high level answer to what is actually quite a complicated question. But hopefully, that gives the the various uh, people asking the question an idea of the issues. Well, certainly we're doing lots and lots of um, advice on agility, including looking at expenses in a completely different way, especially because you may, may not want to pay from, you know, people's um, commute or expenses indeed for if they've shifted to the deepest, you know, deep countryside and you're based in, you know, a long way away. You won't want to, you know, expect to pay their expenses, even if they're just commuting for real purpose, for real business purposes. So um, there's also... Uh... There's also an interesting uh, thought, really, that from an employee point of view, if they're using their home as a workplace um, and, the, and the employer is actually losing office space on the back of that, you know, is there some kind of remuneration for using the home um, as, as a workplace? That, um, so, if you like, workplace as a service. 
<laughs> yes, well, there's, that's a very interesting question, Paul, because I think the majority of people are thinking the other way. And certainly some of the questions we've had today are about salary reduction as a result of lack of commuting. So uh, <laughs> it's an interesting point. But I want to come on. We've got two other big issues which people are concerned about. And one is, can we've talked about how agile working may make the workforce more inclusive, but are there people who can be left behind? And Paul, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. And in particular, um, we've got questions from um, Jeff um, and um, about people who may not be particularly well set up domestically and young people. And we've also got a question from Jackie along those lines. Um, and, um, and also from, um, oh, I think it might be Jeff again. So how can agile working support people who don't have a good working set up and do those people get left behind? I think if we're looking at agile working as you know focusing on remote working because I mean agile working can be different things really in terms of how, how and where you work um, but I think it, it, focusing on the home working piece certainly there is a need to ensure that your digital capability is is going to be there uh, and it works and you're trained to do it so I think there's there's three elements there that you need to come up with People sometimes have issues with um, broadband working, for instance. So, and that may be something that is quite difficult to overcome in certain situations. Not always in, you know, kind of country villages. It can be in parts of towns or in parts of uh, a house. And I know some organisations have actually helped employees with um, getting broadband around the house or the flat or wherever it is. Um, so I think that certainly that is a key key aspect. It's very difficult to work remotely successfully if your broadband doesn't work very well, uh, if your speed's poor, um, and indeed if there are certain types of software that you haven't got, or certain types of so software don't work on on your uh, digital device. So I think digital is at the heart of it, really. Um, and I think that's something between the employee and the firm, depending on how how much support, which we've just talked about, how, how far does that support stretch? Um, and there are going to be some cases where that is um, something that will stop the employee being able to work from home. At the end of the day, as an, as an employee, you've got to be ensuring that the employee is capable of performing effectively. Um, not not just safely, but you know, you've got to be productive as well. So that that may be something that you have to test. I think in the other part of it is personalities. Sometimes certain personalities might find it difficult to work remotely. Um, people who are introverted may quite like being sorted away at home. Extroverts sometimes prefer the challenge of being in an office you know and they like going into the office so I think there's a lot of issues around personality and capability um, and some circumstances that we've already mentioned may be difficult Childcare may be difficult at home if you're trying to work and you've got a small area so the actual environment at home may not be suitable so I think there's a number of things on on that arena about personality digital enablement that, that that people need to look at and take account of to ensure that you can perform safely securely and, and productively that's great paul and and uh, following up from what nicholas said there's no there's no obligation on on you to buy lots of equipment in the uk in fact if you've got people working abroad sometimes there is an obligation to do that in different countries but um we've had quite a lot of questions about you know, what costs you should pay towards an employer working from home. And there is no requirement. It's up to you to decide. But obviously that's part of the, the, the considerations that Paul's talking about, isn't it? Is where people have, there's a digital exclusion or a socioeconomic issue. You may want to, in those circumstances, make um, higher contributions than you would otherwise. So these are all issues that I think employers are gonna wrestle with over the next uh, six months or so. Um, I want to come on um, to talk a bit about uh, whether or not we can do anything um, uh, legally to ensure that people who might be left behind are not, Nicola. 
yeah, yeah. absolutely um and i want to yeah there, there is and in the equality act there is a specific provision which actually a lot of people don't know about um because it's not used uh, it's not used that often um but it's a provision which allows employers to take positive action if there is a group of people who share a protected characteristic who are at a disadvantage because of that protected characteristic or for a reason related to it um, or who are disproportionately affected um, by something at work or have different needs um, again related to that protected characteristic so that might be this will vary massively between employers and particular job roles and working requirements but if for example um, you know you've got younger workers who are struggling with their tech needs or their setup at home um, you know that might give the employer grounds for taking action specifically to address that disadvantage um, now you have to do it carefully you've got to have the data to back it up um, you've got to reasonably believe that they are at a disadvantage because of or for a reason related to the protected characteristic and the action that you take has to be proportionate um, as a means of overcoming that disadvantage or addressing that particular need um, so you know you wouldn't just go barreling in with a policy that says you know right anyone under the age of 25 gets a new ipad or whatever but you might say you know um you know we're conscious that uh younger employees may, doing these roles may need additional tech support and there is this fund available to uh, you know help buy additional equipment or support with what uh, you know additional expenses or, or whatever it is um and it might not you might not say it's limited to those under 25 or those under 30 you know you might say it's uh you know it's for, it, it is targeted at younger workers but also those in these particular roles because you know you might you can't assume that anyone in a junior role is under the age of whatever it is uh, so you know you've got to you've got to balance balance it out in fact take into account all the relevant factors um but i think actually that's something that's that's particularly important as we all kind of discover what the limits of um you know agile working and flexibility and what the impact is and it's going to change um you know what what is what is the position today is not going to be the same in six months there's so much changing so fast um, and people's expectations are changing, the, you know, the ability to travel is changing, people, vaccination status is changing. Um, so, you know, that, but that, that's something I think it's really important that employers know is available to them. It's fantastic, actually. Thank you, Nicola. So positively, there is positive action that you can target. Now, I've got very few minutes left, so I'm going to ask you, first of all, to please complete our final poll on your own plans. Uh, we're interested to know what people are doing, and I think it'll be, it'll be I'm sure enlightening to us all. So I'm asking you, what are you considering about your workplaces? Bearing in mind that 95% of you are considering hybrid working. And we've got one further discussion point, um, which um, is born out of a number of conversations from Jackie, uh, from uh, uh, Sarah, um, from a couple of anonymous people, from Guy, and you're all concerned about a, a two-tier workforce. So um, if you are introducing a degree of, of autonomy um, over flexible working patterns, is there an increased risk of, of inequality and fairness and claims arising from that? Um, how do you manage it? Um, and I'm going to ask um, you, David, to start off and answer a question is, how do you manage a hybrid workforce to make sure that it doesn't develop into those that can work flexibly and those that can't? Um, so I think that so much of this is to do with the way the, 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 the you're right how do you manage it so i think that this is a a management and a leadership um challenge and i think that <laughs> there's lots of things that you can do so i think firstly i think that it's really important when we're thinking about how we manage performance that we are thinking about results and outcomes and impact and not hours and location so that you know that there isn't this thing of actually i see you in the office so i have a sense of you as an individual and you must be making a fantastic contribution to the organization well you might just be coming in and doing the crossword at your desk is what you might be doing um uh, versus somebody that i can't see because that old that old idea so i think that's firstly really important actually how we ma to manage performance effectively it cannot be 
performance by seeing people because that's what we've been doing for the last year it's got to be about outcomes and impact and having the right type of performance conversations i think secondly um i think that in all of the stuff that we've talked about in the session today how do you get teams to engage with each other how do you create spaces for communication what are you using your office for all of those things are part of this answer so actually that it doesn't it should not be so i think being really explicit that access to so that agile working or access to flexibility if that's a, if that's how we want to put it i think in answer to this question is not hierarchical so that what you know that i think is massively important i think you know we've been very very clear at the fscs about you know what we're talking about, we're talking about smart working principles, it's sort of the evolution of our, our journey. And we're saying, actually, we want your home environment to be optimized for productivity, and we want the office environment to be about building collaboration and social connection. Those are all part of the same jigsaw. So I think that's the message that you have to give to people. I think also leaders have to be um, emotionally intelligent they have to be more emotionally intelligent and i know that this is a some leaders this is the thing that's going oh my god what do you mean i've got to ask people how they are um you know so that's one of the great benefits that one of the things that we have learned that i think we want to retain from the, the the learning of the last year is that when we ask people how they are we've genuinely meant it in a way that is different and i think that's a really positive thing and i think that that needs to continue because i think we need to engage with our colleagues whole selves and i saw lots of things in the chat about mental health and mental well-being and that's not for today's topic but one of the ways in which you ensure that actually you are really understanding what's going on is by asking the is asking the question and then really listening properly listening empathetically listening to people's situations so i think how you know the it's not a about how you avoid creating a two-tier system is being really, really clear up front that actually the and what's the, the, the theme of today's call actually about creating greater inclusivity. Mm -hmm. It should be unlocking our ability to create an inclusive environment where everyone can succeed. And I think that if people feel excluded or unable to think, then you have to work with those individuals to say, what is it? That we need to do to make you feel that you are included in this journey because i think um you know it's a great opportunity it's a challenge loads of lo lo nicola's right oh my god in six months time how much we've we learned in the last 12 months so i think we are learning we're all on a very steep learning curve but i think it equally there's massive opportunity here okay and and finally paul um what advice in the early days of agile working, how can we ensure fixed mindsets from traditional working only in the office, concentrating on visible staff? How can we change that mindset? And I've had a few other questions along those lines, mentioning some mentioning dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Paul, how do we change people's mindsets that you can't, if you don't see somebody, it's not the same? I, I think uh, probably the experience we've had has probably changed that already to a large degree but i think how, how do we sustain that is probably important not going back to the way we were is probably the, the key to it and and i think it's a lot of what um david's been talking about it's it's about actually giving people the knowledge and understanding it's creating some um opportunities to talk and engage with one another and to create the understanding. So I think it's being clear about what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're aiming to go. So it's giving a path of, of all of those things as to people being given the knowledge, if you like, to do it, and then engaging and drawing in into it. So it's not being done to them, it's being done with them. So they understand clearly why. And the tools and the support they're going to get bringing them into that environment um, so i think that's the key to sustaining what we've learned and taking that learning forward into the future um, yeah. and it's all about talking and, and, and keeping people involved and i think the other big thing from david's thing is listening yeah listening and then acting that's that's the key to it yeah 
Well, that's extremely helpful. And thank you very much indeed, David, Paul and Nicola on all your wisdom and uh, sensible tips. I am very aware we have got a lot of answers to give you um, in the Q and A's. We haven't answered very as many as I would like to have answered questions, but I think in this session, we've had something like 50 or 60 questions overall before and during the session. So I'm gonna just share the results of the last poll, which you know explain what people are doing, which I think is interesting to us all. And what's actually very interesting is um, that nearly 50% of you are thinking of reducing your office space. And that, you know, obviously is something that many of the people who were talking about everyone back to work, like Boris Johnson and uh, <laughs> the chief exec of the Can Canary Wharf uh, Limited are obviously very concerned about. So yes, uh, <laughs> um, but yes, but it is interesting. It's that high, I'm quite surprised. So that's an interesting outcome of the polls anyway. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us for the session. I found it so in interesting and thought provoking. And I think there has been a lot of discussion that has that others have found the same. Someone's just put in the chat. This has been very uh, enlightening and enabling. And I agree with you, Andrew. I think that's exactly what it is. It's really interesting. So um, we will be doing more sessions on um, agility. Uh, later in the year. So watch out for those. Um, and we will be sending you a copy of the um, uh, the recording of this session and a recording of our previous agility session, uh, which are available on our YouTube channel. If you if you have a YouTube account, I don't quite yet, but I'm sure others do. <laughs> and then um, in addition to that, um, if you are interested in the format of these talks and you don't join us on Tuesdays for our regular Trowers Tuesdays talk, please do. We'll send you an invitation in case you would like to, um, because we do have these fantastic sessions and uh, that are as interesting and inclusive as this one so but finally thank you very much indeed again to the panelists but to also to everyone who's logged in and um uh, stay safe bye bye everybody. thank you emma can i just say one last thing the yes. people who said that they wanted to look at eyes would i share smart working principles and my six questions yes i'll send them to you emma so thank you. Uh, you can circulate them. i will i will make sure we try and answer all of the questions all right okay bye